Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast, where we explore cutting edge strategies to keep teams human centered, drive innovation, and empower you with the tools and insights needed to help your team excel and thrive in today's rapidly changing world. Your host is Dane Grunewald, a seasoned expert with over 20 years of experience in enhancing team dynamics and innovation. Have you ever wondered how stepping out of your comfort zone can elevate your career? Join us to delve into Jenny Wood's journey at Google, where she reveals the pivotal role of self-development, forging key connections, and embracing authenticity in reshaping her professional path. A Google executive guided by her Chase It approach, Jenny established the Own Your Career program, a hallmark of Google's career development initiatives. Her story and insights promise practical strategies for goal attainment and significant career progression. First, learn about the importance of self-improvement in your career. Jenny shares how enhancing skills and embracing new learning can influence your leadership qualities and personal satisfaction. Next, delve into the art of nurturing relationships within your workplace. Jenny explains the benefits of connecting with higher management and how it can unlock new career prospects. Finally, discover the strengths found in acknowledging your limits and mistakes. Jenny and Dane discuss the power of humility and vulnerability in leadership, demonstrating how these qualities can strengthen team dynamics and contribute to individual and collective growth. So, teamwork makes the dream work, and we're here to inspire your next collaborative breakthrough. Gather your team or put on your headphones, and let's dive in together. Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast. This is Dane Grunewald, CEO of Huddle3 Group. And today I'm joined by Jenny Wood, who uh, has a great story. Her on-the-job side hustle is the founder and leader of Google's uh, Own Your Career program. I had to make sure I get that right. You got and, it right. Uh, excellent. That's a good start. <laughs> and, uh, and Jenny does a whole bunch of stuff. She's got a day job. She's a mom, a wife, a tap dancer, and a pilot, I've heard as well. So uh, Jenny, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Dane. It's it's really a delight to be having this conversation. So uh, for the benefit of our listeners, maybe you could give them a little bit of a background on how you came to be finding this this Own Your Career program and, and uh, you know, how that played on some of your superpowers and strengths. Yeah, absolutely. Interestingly, uh, the, the program is so much about building confidence in others, confidence in increasing your impact and influence in your current role and or landing your next role. And it came out of me needing to find my own confidence. Yep. This all started when I was riding the subway home from work one day in 2011, and I saw an attractive stranger, this attractive guy standing about 30 feet away from me. And I started thinking, what's he up to? What's his deal? And I was really taken by him. And I am a straight up data person. I am a spreadsheets kind of gal. There was something that day, some force bigger than me that gave me the confidence that boosted me out of my seat and, and had me make this split second decision to follow him off the subway in New York nice. City when he got off the train. So I followed after him and I tapped him on the shoulder. I said, excuse me, sorry to bother you. And he said, that's okay. You seem nice. <laughs> and I said, you were on my train and I thought you were cute. Any chance I could give you my business card? And I happened to be holding flowers because I was coming from a work event at Google. Actually, I was coming from an acapella rehearsal at Google, believe it or not, because mm. I'm one of those few adults who did acapella <laughs> outside of college. And he thought I was trying to sell him flowers and initially before I had my little intro. And he said, hi, I'm John. And I said, I'm Jenny. And he called me the next day. We went out and, and now we're married with two kids. That's so cool. So I use that example to just show how even though I had plenty of anxiety, plenty of insecurities, plenty of oh, this has to be on a spreadsheet for it to make sense. So much cost-benefit analysis in everything I did in life. That day, I just had some force that pushed me out of my subway seat, that gave me the confidence to follow after him, that gave me the uh, the uh, the chutzpah. There's a Yiddish word, yeah. chutzpah, yeah. to go after what I wanted. And then I adopted that new confidence, that new swagger, that new chutzpah, 
to do that at work and to ask for what I wanted at work, to ask for a raise, to ask for a promotion, to ask for a big project that was important to my senior leadership. And then as I started doing it, I wanted to help others do it too. So I started writing down things that helped me be successful. Yep. And I started sharing that with others. It went viral. And now it's this big program that tens of thousands of people at Google use. That's unreal. I love how it started with a, a romance story at the very beginning. <laughs> it's interesting how that, you know, life can just show up. It, that can spark something that, that, that creates this purpose, this mission, this impact that, that you're now bringing to these tens of thousands of people. It was total spark because, and, and I share that against the backdrop of me not being a very spark believer, yeah. right? I'm yeah. not a huge believer in fate. I'm not a huge believer in the universe will put in front of you what is meant to be. I'm a big believer now in going after what you want, but largely based on that story. And I don't know if I explored the anxiety and the insecurities, you know, that I typically would have enough, but, but what I mean by that is I so often lay awake at night worrying about that typo in my email, or yeah. I, I used to keep my hand down in a town hall with my VP thinking, oh, I'm sure that what I have to ask is not that interesting, or maybe it's going to make me sound stupid. And now I just boldly raise my hand. I boldly send emails knowing that there might be a typo there, but nobody cares. I love that. And I think that's such a huge theme right now. Um, number of guests we've had on this show, a number of articles I've read, podcasts I've listened to, there is this sense that people aren't putting their hands up. People aren't being bold. We talk a lot about psychological safety. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and really, that's what it seems like your program is really addressing. It's creating at least the first steps, the early steps that the individual can own in, in you know, embracing that psychological safety and, and taking that first couple of courageous steps forward. Yeah. And, and for those listening who aren't familiar with psychological safety, it's basically how you feel safe in a group of people and feel and feel like there's an environment created where you can be bold, where you can disagree yeah. with something that is said or be the one that says, well, what if we tried it a different way or you know, or bring an idea to your manager that might be a little bit contrarian to what their boss, the direction their boss wants to go. And then when that psychological safety is there, which is not always a given – but when yeah. there's a team environment that creates that psychological safety, it enables any individual at work, outside of work, in a family construct to be more confident, to speak up for what they want, to ask for yeah. something that might be seen as potentially controversial because they feel safe. Which, which I think... I'll be honest, when I first started coming across some of your work, Jenny, I started thinking, oh, it seems a lot about making money and pleasing the boss. And so oh, I wasn't really thinking it, it has a, 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 an impact on team fabric. But, but from a couple of podcasts I've listened to, you know, leading up to this conversation and from what you've just described there, I think that by having a program like this that is understood and known across an organization like Google, maybe you are creating some frameworks for safety so that it, it is a bit of a team sport. People know you're going through as an individual, but it's it's a it's a company endorsed program. Uh, oh, 100%. It's, a, I mean, it's yeah. just a total passion project at Google. I run an, in my day job, uh, I'm a Google exec who runs an operations team that sits between sales and engineering, but it is fully embraced by the company despite the fact that I sit completely out of HR. But it's fascinating to me, and this highlights that maybe we've established some very quick psych safety, psychological safety yeah. here. It's fascinating to me, and I love that you shared this counter perception around what you initially thought my content was about, which was perhaps making money, pleasing the boss. I, I so welcome that feedback, and it's so interesting to hear because I think at first glance, it could be. There's a lot in there about managing up. There's a lot in there yeah. about how do you... Um, you know, tastefully self-promote, right? We don't want to shamelessly self-promote, but tastefully self-promote. How do yeah. you get the visibility you need, which can be a charged word? How do you get the visibility you need to, you know, move up into the right within your company? But as I have explored the work more, and this is something I'm actually talking about in the book I'm writing mm -hmm. about how to get what you want unapologetically, I have explored how it's not just about making money. It's not just about pleasing the boss. It's really about pleasing yourself. Yes. It's about coming into your full potential. It's about how to build relationships that matter through 
intentional conversation yeah. because those relationships help you be successful at the same time that they help the customer, the partner, your boss, your direct report. But so much of this is about leaving it all on the field, giving it your all so that you can feel good, so that you can feel that you've come into your own potential. Because nobody wants to lose sleep at night thinking, I should have asked that question in my town hall with my leadership and I made myself small. I kept yeah. myself quiet, even though I had very valuable, useful, meaningful things to share, add, or ask. It's really yeah. about coming into your full potential, while at the same time, it can benefit your manager or your company. Yeah. I, actually, I like that framing, and I like the way that you actually brought in um, you know, vendors or customers in there, too, into that team format, uh, because that is important. And I think you are seeing more and more in today's world that having that confidence to have open conversation, open dialogue about where you're at and where that relationship's at can create a lot of positives. You can move through the unknowns, the missing conversations as, as one of our former guests talked about, which can be so uh, dangerous. Yeah, I love that concept, missing conversations. I, I, it's probably similar to something I talk about, which is have the awkward conversation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and another, actually another uh guest Eric Coriel that we work with he's always like the conversation that makes you feel really tight in the chest yes. about having is the one you really got to go and have exactly because if we go down this path for just a moment here yeah I love this let's say there's a an email that your coworker sends you that makes you feel uncomfortable right that gives you that tightness in the chest and you read it and you think oh is this person mad at me you know they seem frustrated they're an important person for me to work with you could then avoid the awkward conversation or maybe what this former guest would call the missing conversation because yeah. that creates even more tightness in the chest. But then you can spend five years worrying about what this person thinks oh, about yeah. you, how you might feel insecure around them. It might limit what you do proactively with them or the confidence you have around them. There's this concept of temporal discounting, which means uh -huh. that people assume that or, or people will take a a long-term discomfort at the risk of a harder short-term discomfort. So that long-term discomfort is just as I described, yeah. five years of a challenged relationship with this coworker. But there's this real short window of discomfort that could happen. Alternatively, if you simply put on your big girl pants or your big boy pants, you have that awkward conversation or that missing conversation. You say, hey, and by the way, this happened to me. This happened with somebody who I work with very closely named Bethany. Uh -huh. She is now one of my closest friends at Google. But back about 10 years ago when I got this email from her, I felt so uncomfortable. And I thought, okay, it's probably worth it to have this awkward conversation now, even though I really didn't want to because of the tightness in my chest. Yeah. Because that could pave the way for such a great relationship moving forward. So that temporal discounting is you discount, you know, how hard that situation is going to be in the short term. And then unfortunately you, you adopt all this pain in the long term. Yeah. It's the, it's the old short term, short term pain, long term gain play, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. exactly. I, I love that. And I've definitely been on the losing side of that equation yeah. where by not having the awkward conversation, I've, I, I've probably lost the quality of a relationship or the opportunity to do something differently in a business or with a customer. So I can see that firsthand. Definitely. That's, it's very common. Yeah. So when you think about your work, a lot of your work from what I understand is is short, snappy, pragmatic, mm -hmm. real world tips. Like you said, you built a lot of this off your own sort of mantras and and, and approach. Um, I, I listened in on one of your podcasts and one of your cool tips was about following growth. Yeah. That, that caught my eye because following growth is something that I personally feel like has been a big part of my career. And it's why I'm talking about teams a lot because I think growth often is best achieved in a team. Um, so I'd love I'd love to understand a little bit more in in your program how you help uh, your students to sort of identify the growth opportunities to follow and and how that may tie into teams. Sure. Well, I think the f the first thing to unpack here is what does growth even mean? And yeah. that's what I found myself wondering as I was walking out of a conversation with a mentor at Google who I deeply admire. And it was the very end of the conversation. And she said, Jenny, let me add one more thing. Follow growth. And and then we were both running to, to other calls. And so I, I 
I took a step back after we, you know, pressed the the red button on the the video call. Yeah. And I thought, follow growth, follow growth. I really got to wondering what what are all the things that could mean. I wonder if it means follow revenue growth. I wonder uh-huh. if it means follow opportunities in a company where they're adding headcount versus reducing headcount. I wonder if that means follow growth personally and where we can learn the most, where we can uh, develop the most from a skills perspective. And then as I was wondering, okay, what did she mean by that? As we quickly hung up on this call and ran to our next meeting, yeah. I realized, well, the one that's most poignant to me is that third one. Follow growth in terms of your skills, your development, learning new things. And that is something I very much guide my own mentees to do, which mm-hmm. is, sure, we can follow money, we can follow fame, we can follow fortune. But when you follow an opportunity to learn something new, to gain a new skill, to try on something new for size, to build new relationships, that's when I personally find I'm most fulfilled. So let me give you a quick little vignette here. It also touches on how lateral moves can be so beautiful and meaningful. Mm -hmm. I was in a New York sales team, a a sales team at Google in New York City. Yep. I moved to a technical team in Boulder. Lateral move, same level to same level. No more money, actually less money because I was moving to a less expensive market in terms of salary. Yeah. But what I learned in that lateral move, because I was following growth, personal growth, was tremendous. So to paint the picture of this team in New York, it was loud and boisterous and extroverted and a lot of bop, 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 bop on the floor, a lot of speaking to think. Yeah. And then I moved to this team in Boulder, this technical team, and it was quieter and it was more introverted and there was a lot more thinking before you spoke. It was just a mm-hmm. completely different culture. And I was struggling. It was I was like a fish out of water because my personality is much more that even though I'm from Colorado, my personality is much more that New Yorker salesy vibe of, you know, yeah. speaking over each other and interjecting and lots of energy. So I was struggling on this new team. And someone said to me, someone I really trust, a peer of mine at the time said, Jenny, can I give you some feedback? And I said, of course, I love feedback. And in the kindest, warmest, most patient way, she said, Jenny, you've been interrupting people. Uh And I went, and she was right. And it's not like I've never interrupted anybody from that day on, but I probably do it about 40% less of the time. And I grew so much as a result of that lateral move. Yes. So when I was following growth, I gave myself an opportunity, not for more fame or fortune or prestige. I gave myself an opportunity to learn something that I deeply needed to learn as a leader. Yeah. I gave myself an opportunity to profoundly grow in ways I didn't even know I needed to grow. And as a result, I am a more skilled leader yes. because of that growth. So yeah. that's what follow growth means to me. I like that a lot. There's a, a, a piece of research I was looking at on teaming hmm. and, and I know Google, large organizations tend to do a lot more teaming around certain themes, projects, and otherwise than, say, smaller businesses. But what caught my eye there, and it does tie back to psychological safety, and I think your example there is a good one, is that when you start to work with the same team all of the time, you probably are not growing because you're not being challenged. Everyone works around whatever dynamics are in the group. Um, But actually, as you go into these new teams, whether you've made a lateral move, whether you got promoted into a new department or whether you're just teaming around a a project or a more immediate milestone, I think that is a hugely um, beneficial time to be testing yourself, testing your skills, growing, developing. Oh, absolutely. Because every time you're, you know, teaming again for the first time or in a new environment, you could yeah. almost rediscover yourself or reinvent yourself or try new things on for size, right? Maybe yeah. maybe if you're listening and you're an introvert and it's 
scary for you to raise your hand or to, uh, you know, share something with your manager in that group setting, maybe in this new environment, you send them a chat instead, or you send them an email, or maybe you self-disclose at the beginning of this, you know, forming stage of of forming, storming, norming, yeah. you know, the classic framework of team building. Maybe if you're in the forming stage, when you're with a new team, you self-disclose that you're an introvert and you you share proactively what works best for you, what yes. what mediums, you know, whether it's verbal versus chat versus email versus a phone call versus a video call, you know, what what mediums work best for you or how you have to just take things in before you can really respond thoughtfully. And that doesn't mean you're not engaged. It just simply means that it's the way your brain processes. So on an yes. old team that might have felt scary, on a new team, you know, you might be at a point in your career where you try new things on for size. You simply try on new try on new tools. Yeah, I like I like that. And that word that you use there, reinvent. Mm. That one strikes a chord with me. I moved around a lot as a kid. So as, every time I moved town or school, I got a chance to reinvent myself. And sometimes I got it right. Sometimes I got it wrong. But it, it, was, a safe, it was a safe time to make a change because no one knew you when you walked in. Yes. And I invite you, all of you listening, to take advantage of that opportunity. And I look back on times where I've missed that opportunity, where I was yeah. so stuck in a bad brand I had or, you know, something foolish I did or a mistake I made. Let's I'll just share a really public mistake. We had a big reorg at Google. Oh, I don't know, maybe uh, circa 2008, 2010. And this big reorg, I was taken from a New York team. I was put on a Chicago team, but I was going to work remotely in New York. And I raised my hand in a really public setting and I said, you know, what was the data that went into how these decisions were made? And that was not a good look for me. Apparently, that was the way I said it. I was I was nervous, but I came across angry. I was passive aggressive. I, I was I, I right. I was truly genuinely curious. But yeah. I, 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 I think someone said I used air quotes for data. Also not a good look. Right. So huge mistake, huge gaff. Um, wish I could rewind time and, and not have done that. Uh, but but I did it, and it was not great for my brand. And then when I moved to a new team, I had this opportunity to reinvent, and I didn't. I was so I was so holding on to my story of what of a negative brand I maybe thought or a negative perception I thought people had mm -hmm. of me. When I wish, you know, like a kid who moved around a lot for various reasons, like maybe you did. I wish I could just let's say I moved from Missouri to you know San Francisco. I wish I could have just shed my Missouri life and left it in Missouri. And yeah. started my new reinvention in San Francisco. But I carried that that feeling, that perception, my own story, my own story that there was this negative brand against me. I carried that neg negative story with me to the proverbial San Francisco, to my new team. I wish I hadn't. So again, for yeah. those of you listening, I invite you to shed any mistake or you know negative situation or brand you perceive, negative brand you perceive having against you. And this could be big things. They could be, these could be small things. Let it go. Yeah. Start afresh. Yeah. Change teams. You know, if you're working with a or new client. Or just own it. Just own, say, or hey, own that it. was yeah, this. That and was now then. I'm, this is now. Yeah. 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 I love that. And also another tip for listeners from me personally uh, is that I've never mastered the use of air quotes, so I just don't think any of us should use them anymore. Wait, side note, side note, because I have two kids. My son is seven, my daughter is five, and my son has just discovered air quotes, but his use, like you, Dane, are, are self-disclosing that you've never mastered yeah. the use. He really hasn't mastered the use, and he thinks that when you use air quotes, so your list, people listening aren't going to see this, I'm air quoting every single word in the sentence. Yeah. So literally... When you use air quotes, every <laughs> word in this sentence goes in air quotes. So if, if for those of you listening, it's like I have a little bunny hopping <laughs> with my fingers every single word of this sentence. So you and my son should hang out and, and discuss air quotes. <laughs> we should. I think we're kindred spirits. <laughs> That's funny. So, um, so some other parts of your work that really capture my eye, um, you talk a lot about stepping into an opportunity to set an agenda with a manager that you, particularly a manager's manager you talk a lot about spending time twice a year with a manager's manager and, sure. and setting an agenda you talk about being visible in the right ways 
Um, but, but doing that through the way that you communicate using bullets, setting three key points, talking about your superpowers. I'd love to explore that a little bit more because that is, uh, I think, a way, particularly for those of us who are more introverted, it's a way to kind of step into this space without putting yourself into too much discomfort. Yeah. And a little bit of discomfort is good, right? That's where yeah, growth yeah. happens. It's on the edge of discomfort. And the way you present it, Dane, is e exactly how I try to break it down for people. It can feel really scary to set up time with your boss's boss. And by the way, let's take a step back and recognize that that's not the norm in all cultures. There are no. a number of old school companies or even new school companies where it's yep. simply not the culture to go above your boss on any topic. So to be clear, this is the intention here is not to go above your boss's head to complain about your boss or to go around them. You always want to keep your boss included. But in many, many corporate environments these days, it actually is natural, expected, accepted mm -hmm. to have a relationship with your manager's manager. But let's look at the data. I was wondering Am I the, the, the kook, the only person who got really nervous for the first 10 years in my career to set up time with my manager's manager? Am I the only one who felt imposter syndrome that I'd be wasting their time? Am I the, the weirdo who like kind of had this desire to do it in my heart, but I'd always put up blockers in front of me that would make me deprioritize it and procrastinate sending the email? Well, the data suggests, no, I was not the only person who had a fear of meeting with my manager's no. manager. And the the reason I say that and 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 anchor it in data is because I, I do a lot of thought leadership on LinkedIn. I did a poll very recently that had about 2,300 respondents. So statistical, Good. you know, like a yeah. high end count. And 37% of people had never emailed their manager's manager asking for time or never contacted them asking for 15, 20 minutes. So a lot of people have this fear. And what I offer to folks who are desiring to do this because they know it's good to build that relationship, right? It can be good for promotion. It be, can mm -hmm. be good for your perception, good for your personal brand, good just to get to know them and know what's on their mind. When people feel stuck, when people feel like there's a blocker they're putting up in front of themselves, break it down into something small. My yeah. newsletter that people can subscribe to is called Big Small Things. So it can feel like a really big thing to build a relationship with your senior leadership. Like, what does that mean? How do I go about it? But it feels very small and manageable to write three bullets to them talking about the things that you're working on or yes. to ask them for 15 minutes, not, you know, not an hour to highlight some of the things that you feel like are your strengths or to simply put three questions in an email to them that say, you know, I'd love to know, one, what's keeping you up at night, two, what are your goals for this year, and three, what are the industry headwinds you see? Yep. Leaders generally love to know what's happening on the ground. And so for people who are earlier in their careers, yes. you might feel like there's nothing you could possibly say that's of value to your senior leadership. But the reality is you're so close to what's happening with the customer, with the clients, with the, your partners that leadership is eager to hear what's happening on the ground because you have information they simply don't have access to. Yeah. So it's flipping the perception that there's nothing you could possibly bring to them that's worth their time to a new perception of, oh my gosh, there's a lot they don't know that I know that I could share with them. And oh, by the way, then they get a chance to know me. They get a chance to know my work and we build a relationship. So Again, it's a, a big, small thing to send an yep. email to your boss's boss asking them for 15, 15 minutes. It's small because it seems manageable. It's big because it can have colossal impact on your career. Yeah. I, I must admit, my, I was just looking for the book. It's, it's in here somewhere. Um, but there's a book that my dad gave me, old school book, Elliot Jacques' Organizational Development. And sure. it talks about manager once removed, manager's yeah. manager. Yeah. The reason it frames that as so important in large organizations is that often, to your point, the manager is busy running a department dealing with today's problems. The manager's manager is looking at two-year, three-year, four-year outlook, bigger problems, different things keep them up at night. And 
so they can start to see developing talent. They can start to give you different insights that your manager who's very focused on the now might not be able to give you. So it's a very constructive relationship. Absolutely, it is. And, and I think what was interesting about that book, given it was probably written in the 60s or 70s, is that in their construct, they encourage the managers to lead the framework where you're more leading the individual to ask. So do you see for other businesses out there that don't have a, a own your career program like Google does that, that leaders should be trying to institute, make this safe for their teams below them? It, Yes, yes, and yes, because a lot of people are still going to get stuck in that fear of, I don't feel right doing this. What would I say? Let yeah. me kick it, kick the can down the road. Uh, I'm going to procrastinate it because I'm scared. So when the leader can, can be the one who initiates the conversation, the invitation, or put office hours on their calendar that are mm -hmm. public for anybody to sign up for, or to send a note once a quarter that says, hey, I'm always available. I'm just a ping away and I mean it. My manager right now, you know, we were going through a, a challenging situation and she said, hey, Jenny, just want to remind you, I'm just a ping away, period. Yeah. I mean it, period. She yeah. sent that to me over chat. That's and powerful. It, it was so powerful. Yeah. And, 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 you know, she always has an open door policy anyway, but I still needed that reminder like that extra push. And this is this is just my manager, not mm -hmm. even my manager's manager. So it just shows you how that power dynamic, that difference in, you know, looking up to somebody thinking there is some master with all the answers and so busy and so important and has all these, you know, three letter fancy acronyms after the name like VP or PhD or whatever it is yes. or CEO, that those can really keep us small and limit our, our boldness when in, in asking for their time. So yes, when the leader can graciously offer up that time and remind people that they're there and that they want to hear, uh, or even go as far as to remind their team that, you know, hey, I'm not some wizard behind a curtain with all the answers. I need the input from the team. I need to know what's going on on the ground to make better leadership decisions. That is yeah. just the icing on the cake. And if your leader doesn't do that, you could always take the initiative on your own. Yeah, I like I like that. You give the individual a chance to take the initiative if their organization leader isn't already driving it. But it's I think it's very healthy, um, and I think there's an added benefit for me personally running small businesses. Uh, yes, you can learn more about the customer, but it's a way for you to cascade your story through the organization. Because if you're talking to you know you look at network analysis in organizations, it's not always the people with a VP or a director title that others in the team look towards. So if you're telling your story about what is a big audacious goal that you're chasing or what's a risk out there in the market and those people have connectivity, they're going to go and share it with their peers and, and maybe, maybe they'll spot something and bring it up or, or act on something that is actually in keeping with that strategy or that risk. Tell me again the name. The, what did you call it? Network Network analysis. Network analysis. So I, yeah. I, I'm assuming this is uh, insights or data or research that suggests that yes. there are going to be people in your network who might not be your direct line of leadership. Maybe it's your boss's peer or maybe it's some other person in another department that has a tremendous uh -huh. amount of influence. Uh, tell me if I'm getting this wrong. No, you're absolutely spot on. That like you kind of have to know a number of people throughout your network because you never know who's going to have that influence and that there are all these interconnected pieces, you know, at play where that could always be influencing each other. Is that the gist of it? Absolutely. I love that because I often say, you know, to, to folks, someone, someone, a mentee was in my office the other day and she said, you know, Jenny, I'm following your guidance. I'm managing up. I've, I, I asked my manager's manager for, uh, for time. You know, I also am interested in getting promoted and what else should I be doing? And I said, are you managing diagonally? And she said, I love what does that. that mean? And I said, well, think of an org chart and, you know, you have your boss above you and your boss's boss above them. But then what about your boss's peers? They are diagonal to you on an org chart. Do you have mm -hmm. any relationships with them? Because in some organizations, big decisions around who gets the key projects and who's going to get promoted, those can be decisions by committee. And sometimes your manager's peers and your relationship with them can have an influence on what those ultimate outcomes are on project assignment, promotion, et cetera. And it's not 
the, the again, I, I mentioned already tasteful self-promotion. The contrast of that is shameless self-promotion. A, a less constructive way to go about this is to set up meetings with every single one of your manager's seven peers and say, I'd like to get promoted in two weeks. <laughs> so I'm setting up time with you. But a constructive way to go about it to tastefully self-promote, not shamelessly self-promote, is to ask them for feedback on a project that is going to be meaningful and useful for their team, or yeah. to bring your key learnings from a customer meeting and ask how they are similar or different to what they're hearing from their customers, or to say, I'm working on this blue widgets work stream. I know you have some people on your team who've also done things that are sort of similar to this blue widgets work stream. Are we duplicating mm -hmm. efforts? Should we combine forces? Should we not all be working on it? So you're bringing things to them that are useful to them. You're providing things that are of value to them, not just simply going in and having them see through the fact that you just want to get promoted. You want to always offer value to the person you're meeting with. Yeah, I think that I think that's a great concept and managing diagonally is a much more obvious way to think about it than network analysis too. Um, yeah, but, but I learned something new, which I'm so excited about because as we talked about earlier, it's all about growth. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think if I, if I go back to like my early career, I grew up as a sales guy. I also managed diagonally sort of down and across in the business. Yeah. You've got, you've got finance and invoicing and and as a salesperson, you're out there going, I've got the greatest deal ever and the terms are terrible. And so you're constantly requiring your teammates in the back office to dig you out of the hole and create value out of the contract that you just won. And I think the more you go out and work with those uh, individuals, they can be reporting up to the CFO or the COO or some other key leader thinking about bosses, peers that, hey, that guy Dane over there, he's really thoughtful. He shows gratitude for what we do. He's trying to learn how our function works. He's trying to help me drive more value into the business. And, and that helps with your growth too. And, and what I hear you also describing is humility, quite frankly, because mm -hmm. it sounds like you went to those other people within your organization to ask for help, even though your ego might have been saying, I got this sales deal. I crushed yeah. it. It's a huge deal. But if the terms aren't favorable to the company, then all right, that's that's not as good of a deal as it maybe seems at, at first glance. No. So by asking for help from others who have expertise that you don't, legal expertise, finance expertise, operational expertise, you are showing vulnerability, you're showing humility, you're showing that you don't have all the answers. And that is a key to building relationships and building psych safety within your company. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That's a Which good ad. It was very hard for me to ask for help early on in my career. Very hard. I wanted to have all the answers. I wanted to show that I could do it all. And as I've become a more experienced leader, I've asked for help much more often. In fact, I think two of the most powerful things a leader can say are, I don't know, mm -hmm. and I was wrong. Now, yes. as a leader, you, you don't want to be wrong all the time. You don't want to never have the answers your team asks you. But it can be pretty meaningful for your team to see you needing to go back to them later with after gathering more information or to acknowledge that you simply do not have all the information you need to give them an answer in that moment in that meeting. So I don't yes. know and I was wrong are two relatively profound things a leader can say. I agree. Or a teammate on the I don't oh, know. I think that's yeah. huge too. Yeah, yeah, I think that they're really powerful statements. And and I guess, you know, thinking towards a final question about your program and working at Google, like I've never worked at an organization as large or as powerful as a Google. There's a ton of smart people over there. Um, so I would imagine the I don't know thing is super scary. But when you look at your business environment and, and the program that you're running, technology's forming both a, a greater foundation for teams, but it's also, um, it's part of the team now and certainly some of the ways that you guys work at Google in terms of what you can access for information at different times um, and how you use the technology. So where do you see, you know, technology being part of the team, helping someone sort of elevate their career? Technology is incredibly useful in helping people elevate their career, mostly from an access standpoint. So I'm mm -hmm. going to use a relatively 
simple example of technology right now. This, what we're doing right now with a a recording software and us being in this virtual environment and us being able to produce a podcast episode that can scale simultaneously to you know it could, it could be millions of people if 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 you know the scale were that large so to think that and this is all about connection this is about us having a conversation that mm-hmm. all of you listening have the benefit of listening into and this is a, a broad example of it but it's about building relationships it's about building human yeah. connection it's about growing together as people through shared ideas and conversation and discourse And if you rewind 20 years ago when this technology did not exist, you and I literally could not have built this connection as two humans. We could not have been able to offer a growth opportunity to all of you listening because this technology of the virtual conference, of the recording, of the, you know, advent of podcasts simply didn't exist. So that's kind of a global example. But even on a very local level, you know, if you had a teammate who's in India and you're in New York City in the past, it would be harder to build that connection because you'd literally have to rely on either phone calls or get on a plane and in a very costly manner, go to India to build that relationship, build that connection, build that psych safety. And now because of very simple technology, we're not talking, you know, AI here, we're talking no. everyday use, used technology, that psych safety can be built so much more quickly with so much more uh, opportunity for helping, healing, um, creating. Yeah. I, I really like that answer, Jenny. I was expecting something a little bit more internal on Google, but you've just created something that is powerful for anyone, no yeah. matter what size of business, whether they're an individual or a team. Yeah. Um, and you're right. It is about relationships. It's about human connection. Uh, so that's, that's a cool note to end on. I mean, this has been a super fun conversation. Um, I think I've learned a lot more about your work and I love the, the, the Genesis story about having that spark to step up and follow John and tap him on the shoulder. What a great story and what a great product of that uh, bold action too. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's just been a pleasure to have this conversation and the work you're putting out there in the world is fantastic. And thank you to all of you listening. You could be doing anything with your time right now. You chose to spend it right here with us. So thank you for giving us an opportunity to contribute to your goals. Thanks, Jenny. And for those uh, looking to connect with more of your work, I know LinkedIn's where you put a lot out there. So that's the easiest way to connect. Yeah. I also have a newsletter. If you go to itsjennywood.com, I-T-S-J-E-N-N-Y-W-O-O-D.com. I mentioned my newsletter, Big Small Things. You can sign up for it right there. That's great. I'll be signing up directly. (laughs) Okay. Fantastic. (laughs) Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Remember that by embracing vulnerability, trusting our intuition, and approaching challenges with compassion, we not only strengthen our teams, but also pave the way for a future where collaboration thrives. If you're hungry for more insights, strategies, and research on collaboration, head over to thefutureofteamwork.com. There, you can join our mailing list to stay updated with the latest episodes and get access to exclusive content tailored to make your team thrive. Together, we can build the future of teamwork. Until next time.